see everybody tonight. I hope you've had a wonderful day. Looking forward to our study tonight. Any announcements you'd like to share with us? Okay. You order seat, whatever you want to do. Whatever you would like to do. If you don't have a good meal, I'm going to miss it. I understand, I understand. You don't have that? Yes, sir. If I have a pizza, yeah. it'll be hungry anyway. You got that right. All right. Sunday dinner will be warm. Okay. Bring that microphone down here. Thank you, Barry. So, Baptist men on Tuesday at 6 30 next week. after church on uh, Sunday after church very briefly we have a couple of training dates that we're trying to coordinate uh, so just a heads up and I'll announce it again uh, Sunday morning thank you anyone else have an announcement well I just want to thank everybody for their prayers and I'm just so grateful that I have a good report from my altar um, I'll <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm still living. <laughs> I'll live one way or the other. You can believe that. Um, but anyway, um, at this time, Miss Thickpin came to my vision. So I thank you very much. And I don't know what you were doing, but you must have skipped out on me. <laughs> no, no uh, actually, uh, as I sat there and just... Just worried about the test all together, just doing it. Almost everybody, I just scanned this room a while ago, and almost all of y'all, one by one, all they can testify to that. I said, oh, I see so-and-so. I said, and I said, they either pray for me or I'm going to pray for them. And so, you know, I, we just all need to stay in prayer for one another, and especially, you know, our church members because we're all believers. And so with that, and my husband and children came to my mind too. I can't forget this man over here. He's been through a lot with me in the last week or two, but it well longer than that. But anyway, uh, 29 years. <laughs> but uh, if I, I just got, if we would pray for uh, like David Owen's son and Tao, 
of these people just trying to make a living, put themselves in, you know, in harm's way every day. So if we could just, you know, keep them in mind. I know we all, you know, have to worry about things like that, unfortunately, but uh, they just really come to my mind here in the last day or so. Thank you. Okay. After the service tonight, I'd like to meet with all the heads of the committees so we can come up with a date to have a nomination committee meeting. So all the heads of committees, just won't take one minute just to figure out a date. All right, any other announcements? If not, how about prayer requests? So please remember um, Reagan Cross and Mackenzie Cross. So Mackenzie um, was pregnant, had her baby, um, a lot of complications. The baby is one pound and three ounces. Um, mama was in the in ICU. She is doing pretty good. She's no longer in ICU. That's Mackenzie. And Reagan, of course, is in the NICU. But everything's um, looking pretty good, uh, you know, for it to be what it is. So please remember that family. Um, I got a good report from my cirrhosis doctor. I thank everybody. And along with cirrhosis, I have varices in my esophagus. And I'm having a procedure on Friday to ban some more of those. It'll be my fourth time. Just hope that you keep me in your prayers because it's not a pleasant experience. Amen. Very special. How about by the upraised hand? Give Mr. Todd that microphone and let him pray for us. Thank you, sir. Hey, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here and we thank you for this fellowship. We thank you that we live in a country where we can come together and worship. And we thank you for the good reports that we've heard and we pray for those that need healing and we pray that you are special healing grace upon them and be with the pastor tonight to have the words that we need to hear that will penetrate our hearts and that we will do thy will. We pray for everything that you will lead us and guide us in and we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we got a special tonight by Jordan and Miss Susie is going to play the piano and the leader on this song. So, Jordan, you come up and favor us with your song. And after that, all those going to Bible drills may do so. What? I couldn't hear you. Oh, yeah.
great job, Jordan. Thank you. All right, Bible drills. So. All right, so good to see everybody. Hope you've had a restful day. Looking forward to our study tonight. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 5 through 15. I want to welcome those watching us on Facebook as well. I pray you've had a wonderful day. Looking forward to the study. And I pray that you are read up, prayed up, and ready to go with it. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, as we begin tonight in prayer, asking all blessings upon the scripture that will be read to study this hour, may you be glorified and honored in all things that are said and done. Father, I pray the scripture will speak to our hearts and this study will help us in our daily walk. And as we go out into the world, Father, we're not of the world, but we're in the world. But as we go out into it, that you will allow us to be able to share the message of Christ with those we come in contact with. I pray you'll pave the way, give us the courage, and we'll use wisdom in how to reach people for Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So verse 5 of Proverbs 15 says this. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth for proof is prudent. So Proverbs is written as we began this study many, many months ago as a father speaking to a son. And it was. It was Solomon speaking to his son, and then many other children along the way. And then as the years have gone on, he's still speaking to us today. And so it is a father speaking to his son, but only a fool would despise the wisdom that a godly father or mother would impart upon them. Would you not agree? Some people think they know it all. Some people think they don't have anything else to learn. I've, I've known some Christians and even some preachers that think that. There's nothing else you can teach me. I know it all. Well, not me, brother. This word is full of good instruction, and I'm always learning. And by the way, as we live our lives, we get older, we go through different phases, and the same scripture that applied to us in our 20s means something totally different by the time we get to our 60s because we're going through different phases of life. In fact, there's some scripture you read, and you just can't get nothing out of it, but you just hang on. The more you read it and the more you live life, one day it's going to speak to your heart because of what you're facing, because of what you're going through, and because of the different phases of life that we go through as well. And so there is always more to learn, but a fool refuses to be taught. Think about a small child. When we are trying to teach them right from wrong, we start out first by telling them, this is right and this is wrong. And we try to instruct them vocally and verbally. And so we try to get them to learn right from wrong first by speaking. But if they persist in doing wrong or not uh, following through with our instruction, then we start discipline after the verbal instruction. If it doesn't reach them, we start by disciplining them in a stronger fashion. And that may be a timeout. It may be a, a tap on the hand or a spanking on the rear end. And y'all remember, I've had many of those through the years. Well, say, for instance, a toddler wants to touch the hot stove and the burner. What's our reaction? No, don't do that. Or maybe they want to take a fork and stick it into the wall socket. And, and so, no, don't do that. But so verbally, we try to teach them right from wrong. And then if they persist, guess what some of us do? No, don't do that. They persist. Guess what some of us do? No, don't do that. If they persist, guess what some of us do? I'm going to count to three. One, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. Listen, if you're going to enforce discipline, you need to enforce discipline. You give them a verbal warning of what is right, what is wrong. If they persist, then you begin with discipline, which, as I mentioned a while ago, could be any number of things. That's how God deals with his children. Let me turn this thing down. God deals with us 
First of all, by speaking to us. His Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, wants to teach us right from wrong, and he's speaking to us. But if that doesn't work, guess what happens? God's discipline gets a little bit stronger. <laughs> Turn it back up. And so we have to listen to the Holy Spirit of God, but if that doesn't work, then God starts enforcing stronger discipline. And the truth is, some of us have a hard heart, hard-headed, and God has to lay us on our back before we ever look up to Him. And so God's got His ways of getting our attention. But say the believer ignores God's Holy Spirit. Then God has to spank us, doesn't He? He has to get our attention one way or another. And so we, we realize that learning wisdom is more than just learning facts. It is learning correction and to follow through with that correction. If a child listens and obeys when the parent speaks to them, they avoid a more severe form of punishment. But a foolish child ignores the instruction. They're hard-headed. And they keep on, and you know, many parents have foolish children. They try to teach them right from wrong verbally, but they will not listen. And some people, I've known some parents, even in their own family, they can just look at one child and they'll cry, break down, but the other child has to have whooping after whooping to understand right from wrong. And so it's, it's not that a parent hates a child. In fact, it's different. A parent loves a child, and that's why we need to enforce the discipline. And so it is with God and with us. It's simply because God loves us and does not want us to go off on our own, doing our own thing. He wants to correct us and help us to be right. Notice verse 6. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. And so this could be true of material wealth, but most certainly true of spiritual wealth. God desires to lavish us with his riches. The treasure that is found in the house of the righteous are things we already have, but maybe we do not realize just how precious these things are. Things like love, comfort, peace, strength, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And the real treasures that we have are found in Christ. There's a lot of people that go through the same things you and I go through, and they don't know how to cope. And the reason you and I are able to go through some of the same things they go through is because we have a shelter. He shelters us from the storm. The storm still comes. The storm still comes. But God's shelter helps us survive the storm. You take these raining cats and dogs outside and you walk out, you don't have no umbrella, you don't have no gear, and by the time you get to your car even, you're soaking wet. But listen, you have an umbrella or you have a rain suit on, you have galoshes, you have a, a hat on and you walk out, you're not soaked. In fact, you're still as dry as you ever were. Now, the, the layer outside is wet, but you're not wet. And guess what? You didn't stop the storm but you were sheltered from the storm. That's what God does for us. God shelters us from the storm. And so we need to rely upon him. In fact, the earnings of the wicked surely bring trouble. But remember, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Not money itself, but the love of money that's the root of all evil. And some people will do anything and harm anyone to gain riches. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. To share knowledge with someone that can help them in life, that's a great virtue. You and I ought to be helping others. We ought to share what God has opened our hearts and revealed to us and be able to help other people in their lives. And so it's, it's compared to sowing seed. Like the, the good man who went about sowing seed and he's throwing that grass seed out or the fruit tree seed out and he's sowing that seed so it'll grow up and be nice and fresh and fruitful. But then notice the foolish are always selfish. And they're also sowing. But it's not the seed. It's, it's the tares and the weeds. And 
They're trying to choke out the good seed that you and I are trying to spread out. And so we need to be careful. It is compared to sowing tares or the weeds that choke and kill that produce life. When you think about it, uncontrolled speeches. We talked about the tongue last week when we started chapter 15. A soft answer turneth away wrath. When you think about it, uncontrolled speech causes more problems between people than just about anything you can ever imagine. The foolish things that we often say get us into more trouble than we can even begin to realize. And once you say something, you can't take it back. It's there. Oh, you can ask to be forgiven and you'll be forgiven by a Christian. But those words still hurt, as we said. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. That's a lie. Those words do hurt. Wise people make it a habit to control their speech. To control their speech. And we are to use our words to put out fires, not fan the flames. Amen? Now think of all the marriages that's been damaged by harsh words. Think about all the friendships destroyed or families torn apart. Think about all the jobs that have been lost or maybe the churches that have split over harsh words of not watching how we speak to someone or not watching how we speak about someone. And so we need to be careful in our words. Look at verse 8. It says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So God rejects the wicked in their sin. But notice as Samuel said to Saul, Behold, it is better to offer or to obey than to offer sacrifice. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, it says these words. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And so the godly man or woman delights God with their prayers. I think I'm catching a cold, y'all. So y'all just bear with me. In verse 9, listen to what it says. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. God loves and blesses the righteous man. Look in verse 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. So when a man or a woman departs from God's ways in mercy, God will send them discipline. The discipline is a warning, an opportunity to change our ways. You know, God, He doesn't just come down hard on us. He allows us time to change. To come to Him before He has to come to us. And even the Scriptures teach us it's way better if we'll go to God before He has to come and approach us. And so we need to be careful. The one who hates correction and refuses God's correction will end up dying one day and in their sin, they'll die the physical death, which leads to spiritual death, eternal death. Look at verse 11. It speaks of this. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Hell and destruction are ever before the Lord. It's a reality. We think about what the Lord does in our lives and what He does in the lives of individuals to offer salvation and yet, if we could look into hell right now, a lot of people think hell's a big party. They think, well, I'm going to go to hell and be with all my friends. Oh, no, you're not. Hell is a place of solitary confinement. You're in your own place. Hell is a place that's got bars. The gates of hell shall not prevail, is what Jesus said to Peter. And there's chains. The angels are chained with darkness. And, and so we see that it is a place of solitary confinement and there's gnashing of teeth because of the pain and the torment that is associated with hell. Now, if you were to be able to look into hell, you would see the, the people in agony and you would hear their screams, see their tears flow, but even their tears cannot drench the pain and the flames of hellfire. And it's a place of awful weeping and agony and keeping the prisoners inside. And you would see souls that are begging for relief, but there's no relief to be found. 
So you and I must never give up and never fail to try to take an opportunity to witness to someone who is still lost without Christ. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a church member. As we said last week, not everybody that comes to church is a Christian. There's a lot of lost people. In fact, some of you were going to church before you ever got saved. Are you hearing me? And then you got saved after you started coming for a while. And so we know that not everybody that comes to church is a Christian. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, if I keep on at my family, they're, I'm going to drive them farther away. You can't drive them no farther than they already are. They're lost and on their way to a devil's hell. Now, I would suggest you don't need to browbeat them with the gospel, but you need to approach them in love and share with them the gospel. Let them know you love them and care for them. Because I'm going to tell you, what's going to be worse? It's far better to have them shun you now because they'll see you come and say, oh no, here comes that holy roller mother of mine. and I know she's going to start talking to me again about Jesus. Is it better for them to say stuff like that? Or one day when they end up in hell, to cry out and plead, why didn't you insist I accept Jesus? Why didn't you try harder? We need to be without failure and without question in trying to reach people for Christ. And so try to reach people. Don't browbeat them. Don't go to them and say, you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. They know that already. But go to them in love and share with them the message. And let your heart's appeal win them over because they see how much you love them. Look at verse 12. It says, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. The scorner, the scoffer, never likes to be rebuked. I mean, that probably applies to all of us. Nobody likes to be talked down to and, and said that we're doing wrong or we're not doing right. And they refuse to listen to good sound teaching of God's salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. It says, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. When your heart is happy, most of the time it notifies your face. Huh? When your heart is cheerful, most of the time everybody can tell. You walk with a spring in your step. You got a different countenance all about you. Well, look here now. When your heart is sad, it also notifies your face. It also has a countenance about you that says, I'm sad today. And instead of walking with a spring in your step, you'll walk with shuffling feet, shoulders stoop. Everything is going against you. And so the heart is what we're speaking of here. And so our face gives our hearts away. Look at verse 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seek of knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Those who are wise will seek to become more wise. So it is with the foolish. They crave more foolishness. And then we come to verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, the heat is of a merry heart, hath a continual feast. And so the afflicted refers to those who are wicked. Their days are marred by evilness. He is of a merry heart, have constant satisfaction. Constant satisfaction and delight in all conditions, yea, even in afflictions. And no, no one of us love affliction to come upon our lives. But as Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. We have learned that even when afflictions come, God's got a reason for it. We try to learn what the reason is. We try to evaluate what is God doing in my life to bring me to this point. And so he that is of a merry heart have satisfaction and delight even in affliction. You see, afflictions, troubles, trials, they come to all of us. But here's 
something to consider. Is that what you dwell on? When they come, is that what you dwell on? You see, troubles come, but they don't come to stay. Four of my favorite words in all the Bible is these four words. It came to pass. And you'll see them all through the scriptures, those four words. It came to pass. Trouble doesn't come to stay. It comes to pass. Every one of us can look back at a time when we shed tears and our hearts were heavy, but God brought us through. And if you're in that condition tonight, your heart is heavy, you need to remember, God brought you through before, He'll bring you through again. Because that's our God. Amen? Now, the devil would love nothing better than for us to focus on our problems. Because when we focus on our problems, we quit focusing on God who is bigger than all of our problems. Take Jacob. You remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had a conversation with the Pharaoh that Joseph was in the land with. And after Jacob had moved into the land as well, and he started talking about all the hardships of his life. In fact, let's, let's just let him speak for himself. Genesis 47 verse 9 says this. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob began to recount to Pharaoh all the hardships of his life. He was dwelling on his hardships at the time instead of how God brought him through. He was talking about all the hardships he went through. Let's just talk about some of those hardships. Maybe he said to Pharaoh, well, my brother hated me. You remember Esau? Boy, he hated me. He tried to have me killed. And then my father-in-law, he hated me. You know what he did to his father-in-law? He tricked him with the cattle and he took all the best cattle for himself. And, and so his father-in-law hated him. Then he talked about all the wives he had. They were all envious of one another. And man, they just gave me a world of trouble. And Then I, I had a perpetual limp where I wrestled with the angel and I limped for the rest of my life. My sons, they're all liars. And most of them are anyway. Incestuous, envious, murderers. My favorite wife died in childbirth. And my favorite son was supposedly killed by wild beasts. Those other sons made me believe that for all these years. And on top of all that, I'm not going to live as long as my parents and grandparents did. They lived to be 175 and 180. I'm only going to live a few more years. In fact, he only did live to 147 years. And so he was looking at all this stuff. He was saying, poor, pitiful me. He was focusing on his troubles. You know what? You and I do the same thing. We're not careful. We serve a mighty God. We know how great he is. But once in a while, we start focusing on the wrong things. And that's just what the devil wants us to do. Because when we start focusing on the wrong things, we quit focusing on the right thing. Because he's God. Amen. Are y'all hearing me on that back row back there? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now think about the Apostle Paul. He took pleasure in infirmities and affliction. Took pleasure. Now, I haven't said nothing to nobody, but maybe Susie, maybe one or two more. But I, I'm getting old, I'll tell you. I started aching in my left hip. If I move my leg wrong, there is a sharp pain in my hip. Today, my right hip started. <laughs> My knee was starting about a couple months ago. What's that? It came to pass. Oh, it came to pass, yeah. But here's the thing. If I start focusing on all my ailments and I quit thinking about how good God is, I'm going to be in the same shape what Jacob was doing. Oh, poor pitiful me. Let me tell you. Sometimes people say, you ask a question, how you doing? And you, you immediately say, oh, I wish I hadn't asked that. Because they begin to tell you exactly how they're doing. 
And then you just wait for them to take a breath so you can get out of there. <laughs> but Paul took pleasure in afflictions. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul said, I take pleasure in these things. Because when I'm weak, then I know I'm strong because God is with me, leading me through all of this. James, the half-brother of the Lord, he said it counted all joy when you're going through tough times. I don't think I'm there yet. To count it joy when I'm going through tough times. And listen to what he says in James chapter 1 in verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or testings, knowing this, that the trying in your faith work of patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So Paul took pleasure. James says, count it joy. And what do we do? We're like Jacob. Poor, pitiful me. Let me tell you about my tough day. We just continue to recount what Satan wants us to focus on. Instead of focusing on what we need to be appropriately focusing on, which is Jesus. Now here's a thought. The difference in the righteous and the wicked is not the absence of trials, but the way we respond to them. It's all in our response. How we respond when tough times come. An example of this is Paul and Silas. They were thrown into a dungeon. Not for doing something wrong, but for doing something right. For preaching the word of God and winning souls to the Lord. They went about and they were winning souls. And, and here's the event that put them in the dungeon. Paul was preaching and this maiden, the young maiden, was following along behind them, had the spirit of divination. She was possessed. And she followed around and Paul was preaching. And he was preaching to the people. And this little girl, this maiden was following behind. Y'all listen to this guy. He's a servant of the Most High God. You listen to what he's got to say. He'll lead you right. Now what she said wasn't wrong. It was true. It was right but it was inappropriate at the time she was saved. Why? Because she was disrupting the service. All the attention went off of what Paul was doing and preaching the word to this maiden. All the eyes went off of Paul and they started focusing on the maiden. She become the center of attention. Y'all listen to this guy. What he's telling y'all is right. Paul got fed up with her. Paul turned around at her and put the holy hand upon him, her head and exercised that demon out of her. And she became whole that very hour. Well, that made all the people that made a lot of money off of her very angry. And so they went talking to the, the authorities and that one thing led to another and it led to Paul and Silas being in the prison. He in the stocks, held fast, whipped. If that was ever a time to sing gloom, despair, and agony on me, that was the time. But the Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed the same praises. And the prisoners heard it. They arrested all the attention of the prisoners and they got them involved in a prayer service. And it was like they were having a high time. Then an earthquake came, broke the bands off of everybody's arms and the stocks, and then the doors of the prison were flailed open. The jailer upstairs, 
he come down, he heard all this music and all this singing going on and it was getting to him. But he went down and saw that the doors of he he thought to himself, they have fled and escaped because it was dark. He couldn't see. He drew out a sword and was about to ram it through himself because he even knew he would meet an awful fate. And just about the time he started to ram it through himself, Paul called out from inside the prison, Do thyself no harm. We're all here inside and safe. Did you ever call for a light? Went in there with his torch and saw all the prisoners and Paul there. And you remember what he did? He fell right down and said, I don't want y'all die. What must I do to be saved? Why do you reckon Paul and Silas had to endure the affliction, being beat, going to the dungeon? If that had not happened, that Philippian jailer would never have gotten saved. Nor his family, by the way. Think about this. The next time you begin to wonder, God, what are you doing? This is not how I had my life planned out to be. What are you doing in my life? He just may be setting you up to make a difference in somebody else's life. Just like with Paul and Silas. He set them up to make a difference in the jailer's life. He may be setting you up to make a difference in somebody else's life. So in whatever situation in life you find yourself in, have a merry heart. Whatever circumstance. And allow God to work through you to be a blessing to somebody else. Anybody have a testimony or comment? Yes, sir. and they didn't know if she was going to pull through and wanted him to come down and witness to her. And so he got on a plane, flew down, and as soon as he got off the airplane, he went straight to the hospital. And she was Catholic, diehard Catholic. And uh, David led her to the Lord before. And uh, so y'all y'all just keep that lady in, in your prayers that the Lord would bless her and everything and keep blessing my son-in-law's ministry and I mean, he's he's on fire for saving souls so y'all just hey. pray for him hey. you know our heavenly father as we close out tonight may you be glorified and honored and everything's been said done and scripture read we thank you for Jordan who sung that song for us tonight to, to lead us into a, a Bible study Lord that Music always soothes the hearts. And Father, we thank you for her. And then for our youth choirs that continue to grow. Father, we ask your blessings upon each of us now as we go our ways. And may you be glorified and honored in our very lives that we live. And may we bless you in those lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, all the heads of committees for just a second.